All right, recording has started. Welcome to Thursday. Uh, I've got a I've got a story for you guys today. Ooh, the Fermi paradox, and we are one week and one day from the uh, from spring break. Uh, you guys, okay. So for my AP classes, you guys remember there's this review quiz uh, to do tomorrow. Um, you guys had this a while, so uh, if you lost it, I've got some extra copies here, but um, pick that tomorrow. And then I, I want to get those uh, rated uh, back to you guys before uh, before spring break. Uh, quarter three ends next Thursday. That's one week from now. Okay. And then teachers have some extra time after that to get the grades in. But that is the official end of quarter three. All right. Flip over to. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Gotta get this right. I gotta switch 10%, otherwise if I set the screen, let's do this. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> now we are cooking the Fermi Paradox. So this is an essay by Tim Urban. Uh, everyone feels something when they're in a really good starry place, a really good starry night, and they look up and say, see this. How many guys ever been out in the deep country where there's no light pollution, seeing the, the, the real night sky? Yeah, see all, see all the stars? Imagine for thousands and thousands of years, uh, people live without any kind of light pollution at all. It's only been the last about 100 something years that there's been any kind of light pollution. So yeah, people would see the, um, see, uh, like the full stars, uh, this band of stars going across here, it's like the central plane of the uh, Milky Way galaxy, uh, main part of the disk. Um, the, the term Milky Way comes from this idea that it looked like you know, somebody spilled their milk across the sky. Uh, some people stick with the traditional feeling struck by epic beauty or blown away by the insane scale of the universe. Personally, I go for the old existential meltdown followed by acting weird for the next half hour. Everyone feels something. Physicist Enrico Fermi Fermi felt something too. He asked the question, where is everybody? So, um, to, to take you guys up with a little bit of the context here, this, this is Enrico Fermi. Uh, you guys know the Manhattan Project back in the 1940s, uh, the, the first uh, atomic weapons were created, uh, funded by the uh, US government. So he was one of the scientists working on this project. And to give you guys a story that's eventually gonna sort of tangentially connect to this, uh, when, uh, scientists were trying to figure out, trying to measure what is the, uh, how large is this uh, explosion, this nuclear explosion, like how many tons TNT equivalent, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so the different ways of measuring it, but what he did was while this explosion was going on, he was there at the site, uh, they didn't know it was going to be radioactive at the time, whoops, uh, he took this little piece of paper and dropped it as the blast wave was coming across, and if you knew the mass of the paper and like the density of the air and how far he dropped the paper from and how far it cluttered. He, he put some variables together and got a pretty good estimate that was actually uh, not too far off from how large uh, that explosion was. Uh, and he was known for doing things like this, like say, well, if you want to tackle any like weird problem, uh, like you know, how big is that nuclear explosion? Or the question we're going to get to here is like how much intelligent life is out there. Uh, but you have no, no numbers to re really base anything on. Well, you can do a series of estimates and uh, multiply numbers together and actually get a pretty accurate um, guess that um, using this method actually works uh, like pretty well. Okay, so we're about to do that with something called the Drake equation. Take you guys through. All right, so back to the essay. Uh, a really starry sky seems vast, but all we're really looking at is our very local neighborhood. On the very best nights, we can see up to about 2,500 stars, roughly 100 million of the stars in our galaxy. And almost all of those are less than 1,000 light years away from us or well, less than 1% of the di diameter of the Milky Way galaxy. So when you guys look up and see all those stars, e even if you go out like into Midwest of the States where there's no light pollution, look up, see you know, crazy number of stars, see all the constellations, like there's Orion, there's the Big Dipper. That's all in tiny, 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 tiny circle, you know, this tiny percentage of the, uh, the entire Milky Way galaxy. Now, of course, this is not actual picture of the Milky Way galaxy. We don't have cameras there, but this is another galaxy that might look kind of like ours and for scale that, uh, that tells the story. 
uh, when confronted with the topic of stars and galaxies, a question that tantalizes most humans is, is there other intelligent life out there? So let's put some numbers to it. Uh, now, we're about to go through a part of the story. I'm going to do an external reference here. Uh, the Drake equation. So this is getting out in the number of civilizations in our galaxy uh, that maybe we should have some kind of communication with or contact with. Uh, we're going to start with, well, how many stars are out there? And then start multiplying by all these factors. Well, what percent of those are sunlight and have planets that are like Earth that might develop life, that might develop technology, that, you know, blah, 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 down the chain, right? So uh, the, let's say, as many stars as there are in our galaxy, somewhere between 100 and 400 billion. Pause here. You guys see I have a poster over there. It has a million dots. You guys have seen a million dots, right? You have a dollar for every dot, you'd be a millionaire. So take that poster times a thousand. So a thousand of those posters would be a billion. And then a hundred of those thousands gets you to a hundred billion. And that's just the lower limit of the uh, uh, estimate of the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So for every, uh, as many stars in there are in our galaxy, there are roughly an equal number of galaxies in the observable universe, right? So you guys see uh, Hubble deep, ultra deep field, there's the edge of the universe, or well, edge of the observable universe, just like uh, hanging above my door right there. Uh, so for, uh, for every star in our galaxy, there's another galaxy out there. Uh, altogether, that comes to a typically quoted range of between 10 to the power of 22 and 10 to the power of 24 total stars, uh, which means that for every grain of sand on Earth, there are 10,000 stars out there. The science world is not in total agreement about what percentage of those uh, stars are sun-like. Uh, that's to say, um, similar in size, temperature, luminosity, the idea being that maybe more likely to develop life. Uh, opinions range somewhere between five and 20%. Let's go with the more conservative side of that, 5%, and the lower end of the number of stars, uh, 10 to the 22. Multiply those two together, that gives you 500 quintillion, that's to say 500 billion billion sun-like stars. There's also a debate over what uh, percentage of those sun-like stars might be orbited by an Earth-like planet, say one with similar temperature conditions that might have liquid water and potentially support life on Earth. Now, um, one of our assumptions going on is that, okay, well, Maybe life needs liquid water, or maybe there'd be a correlation between the two. Uh, I mean, would that be true? I mean, we only have one planet that we know has life on it, so it's kind of hard to draw conclusions from one data point. But um, I mean, you know, why not? Right? Uh, so we're looking for planets that maybe are in this Goldilocks zone and not too hot or cold. Maybe they have liquid water. That might be good conditions for life to develop. Uh, let's go with the more conservative 22%. Uh, that came out of a recent PNAS study, that suggests that there is a potentially habitable Earth-like planet orbiting at least 1% of the total stars in the universe for a total of 100 billion billion Earth-like planets. So there are 100 Earth-like planets for every grain of sand in the world. Think about that next time you're on the beach. Uh, moving forward, we have no choice to, to get completely speculative. Let's imagine that after billions of years in existence, 1% of Earth-like planets develop life. If that's true, then every grain of sand would represent one planet with life on it. And let's say that 1% of those planets, now we're going to use 1% numbers from again, just complete speculation, we're just our numbers at a wall, why not? And 1% of those planets, the life advances to an intelligent level like it did here on Earth. Maybe intelligence means that uh, we can communicate easily, we can uh, use tools and develop technology and write stuff down and pass information on to the next generation. So, uh, some kids to school, pay the teachers. That would mean there were 10 quadrillion or 10 million billion intelligent civilizations just in the observable universe. Like, now, all these numbers so far, the, the, the hard numbers have been, I mean, 10 to the 22 planets. We're talking about the observable universe. Maybe that's too big. So, Let's move back to just our galaxy, just Milky Way galaxy, and do the same math, right? Lower, lower estimate number of stars, 100 billion stars, multiplied by all those proportions. We would estimate that there are a billion Earth-like planets and 100,000 intelligent civilizations just in the Milky Way galaxy. 
SETI, acronym stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is an organization dedicated to listening for signals from other intelligent life. If we're right that there should be, you know, just by these numbers thrown at the wall, 100,000 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, and even a tiny fraction of those are sending out radio signals or laser beams or other uh, modes attempting to contact others, shouldn't SETI's satellite array pick up all kinds of signals? But it hasn't, not one ever. So where is everybody? Well, there have been a couple of like weird anomalous signals, but nothing that's been like, sustained or like if you like, keep the camera for it. So yes, yeah, so, so nothing, not, nothing has been confirmed um, as like, like, oh yeah, that's definitely communication. It gets stranger. Our sun is relatively young in the lifespan of the universe. There are far older stars with far older Earth-like planets, uh, which in theory should mean civilizations far more advanced than our own. As an example, let's compare our four and a half billion year old Earth, four and a half billion year old Earth to some hypothetical eight billion year old planet X. Okay. Just think about the time scales of these things. Right? Uh, no, uh, we know the Earth is about four and a half billion years old because um, the oldest rocks are consistently four and a half billion years old. If you compare the ratio of like lead to iron, right? So, uh, sorry, um, lead to uranium. So uranium radioactive goes through this radioactive decay process and eventually becomes stable at lead. Uh, so some fresh uranium is 100% uranium. If it's been sitting around for like a trillion years, it would be 100% lead. And if you see the proportion of lead to uranium, uh, you, you can you can calculate the age of the rock. The oldest rocks in uh, Earth and around our solar system are consistently four and a half billion years old. So that's the age of our solar system. Um, it's one, one thought that's out there, I mean, you would know for sure, is that our sun might actually be not even a first generation star, but it might be a second or third generation star. So it used to be a larger star. It went nova, created all the elements and the planets. And then, uh, but um, so, so we look at a scale like this, and, and let's start to compare it to things that maybe are more a little bit more tangible. So uh, modern civil, well, well, civilizations that started with agriculture only go about 10,000 years. Uh, our species is only about a quarter million years old. The dinosaurs died out about 67 million years old. Uh, and our ancestors at the time were like these you know, tiny mammals running around, like, rodent like creatures. Uh, so, yeah, you go back four billion years or eight billion years, right? You're talking about like insane time scales. That's insane amounts of time for opportunities for like technology to develop. Oh, right. Uh, so, we're comparing Earth to this hypothetical purple planet X. If Purple Planet X has a similar story to Earth, let's look at where their civilization would be today. Uh, so the technology and knowledge of a civilization only a thousand years ahead of us could be as shocking to our world, uh, as shocking to us as our world would be to a medieval person, right? I mean, imagine this, you jump in the time machine, go back a thousand years ago to medieval times, you whip out your cell phone, start doing calculations, but you probably end up burned at a stake because they would just like, what is that? Uh, a civilization a million years ahead of us might be as incomprehensible to us as human culture is to chimpanzees. And this hypothetical purple planet X might be three point something billion years ahead of us. There's something called the Kardashian scale, which helps group um, intelligent civilizations into three broad categories according to the amount of energy that they use. A type one civilization would have the ability to use all the energy on their planet. Uh, we are not quite a type one yet, but we're close. Uh, Carl Sagan, he was this um, astronomer, sort of the uh, Neil, De Neil deGrasse Tyson in the 1980s, created a formula for the scale, which puts us at about a type 0.7 civilization. A type two civilization can harness all of the energy of their host star. Our feeble type one brains can hardly imagine how someone would do this, but we've tried our best imagining things like this Dyson sphere. So a Dyson sphere might be a physical shell or maybe just a series of billions of sat satellites that orbit a, a star like the sun and just collect enormous amounts of energy. And then you can do crazy things with enormous amounts of energy. A type three civilization blows the other two away, accessing power comparable to that of an entire galaxy, like the entire Milky Way galaxy. If this level of advancement sounds hard to believe, remember that purple planet X and their 3.7 billion years of further development, 
uh, if a civilization on that planet X had been similar to ours, able to survive all the way to this type 3 level, but the thought is that they probably have mastered interstellar travel by now, possibly even colonizing the entire galaxy. How would they do that? One hypothesis uh, as to how they would do that is by creating machinery that can travel to other planets, spend about 500 years or so self-replicating using raw materials on the planet, sending off two replicas to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, Pause here, give you guys a little context. So uh, here's what we're doing. This, we're going to start the, the, the base planet like Earth. So now a couple of probes. We're going to spend hundreds of years terraforming these planets. Right? And, and then you know, rinse and repeat. Right? Well, how long would this type process take to cover the entire galaxy? And I just made this whole deal about how crazy big the galaxy is. It has like 100 billion stars, a number that's so large it's just unfathomable to, to our brains. right? So maybe that would take a long time. Actually, not so much uh, because what you're looking at is exponential growth. Um, this is a story I remember my uh, fifth grade teacher wrote to us in a ball. Uh, try to get the relevant details here. Uh, somebody with like this poor guy in India went up to the, the king and said, challenged him to some bet, like, could you cover a uh, chessboard and rice grains? And the way they would do this involved exponential growth. So we'll put one grain on the first square and two grains on the next square and then four, eight, 16. And so he, he had some deal with the king, and the king takes him up on the software because the king doesn't understand math and exponential growth. Well, they get to about the 20th square and realize that, oh, there's not enough rice in the entire world to, uh, to fill this chessboard. So, uh, so hey, we got the uh, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So how long would actually this take, even if you spent hundreds of years like terraforming at each step? Well, back to here, according to this, even without traveling anywhere near the speed of light, so just conventional speed, this process to colonize a whole galaxy would be less than 4 million years. 4 million years. That is a relative blink of an eye when talking about the scale of billions of years. Right? Or even just in context, dinosaurs died out 67 million years ago. So what's 4 million years compared to that? <laughs> Nothing. Continuing to speculate, if 1% of intelligent life survived long enough to become a galaxy colonizing type three civilization, our calculations above suggest that there should be at least a thousand of these type three civilizations just in our galaxy alone. And given the power of such a civilization, their presence would likely be pretty noticeable. And yet we see nothing, hear nothing, visited by no one. So where is everybody? Welcome to the Fermi paradox. So remember I told you a um, story about Enrico Fermi dropping the paper and estimating the size of the nuclear blast and actually getting a pretty good estimate. Well, he did a lot of calculations like that. This is the process that he regularly did. He did this process you know, using this Drake equation and this thought process, right? He figures, okay, well, there should be at least a thousand of these civilizations. They should be all over the place. We should see them, we should hear them or not. That's the paradox. The paradox is between what the math predicts uh, and our observations. Uh, so we have no answer to this Fermi paradox. The best we can do is possible explanations. And if you ask 10 different scientists what their hunch is about the correct one, you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, you know, when you hear about uh, humans of the past debating whether, uh, let's go back to here, okay. uh, whether the earth was round or if the sun revolved around the earth or thinking, thinking that lightning happened because of Zeus and they all just seem so primitive and in, in the dark. Uh, that's about where we are with this topic. And taking a look at some of the most discussed possible explanations for the Fermi paradox, let's divide them into two broad categories. All right, so two broad categories. Those explanations that assume that there's no sign of these type two and three civilizations because there are none of them out there. And the other category, those that assume that they are out there, but we're not seeing or hearing from them for some other reason, right? So the, the rest of this essay, we're gonna look at one of these two different groups. Uh, one of these two different camps of thought. And with, within each camp of thought, there are um, like, uh, sub -ex explanations. So explanation group one, there are no signs of higher civilizations because there are none of them out there. Those who subscribe to group one explanations point to something called the non-exclusivity problem, which rebuffs any theory that says there are higher civilizations, but none of them have made any contact with us because they all fill in the blank. Uh, group one people look at the math, which says that there should be so many thousands, you know, thousands or more of these civilizations that at least one of them would be an exception to the rule. So even if some theory held for 99.99% of these civilizations, the other 0.01% uh, 
would behave differently and we would become aware of their uh, existence. Um, so just one quick concrete example, way later on in this essay, uh, he floats this idea of something called the zoo hypothesis. So this idea that, well, maybe aliens are watching us um, and, and they're not supposed to talk to us because like, oh, we, we want to see how technology develops. And we've got a, a rare example in real life of seeing these people um, actually develop technology. So what's the story going to be? So let's, let's nobody interfere with them or talk to them. Well, you know, I mean, if there's a thousand of these guys out in these civilizations, somebody's going to break the rule and right, stop by and say hi. Right? Uh, therefore, say group one explanations, it must be that there are no super advanced civilizations. And since the mass suggests that there would be thousands of them in our galaxy, just in our own galaxy, something else must be going on. That's something else is called the great filter. Um, Aha, great filter. Great filter theory says that at some point from pre-life to type three intelligence, there's a wall that all or nearly all uh, attempts at life hit. There's some stage in the long evolutionary process that is extremely unlikely or impossible for life to get beyond. This stage is the great filter. Uh, if this theory is true, the big question is, where in the timeline does the great filter occur? It turns out when it comes to the fate of humankind, this question is very important. Depending on where the great filter occurs, we're left with three possibilities. One, we're rare. Two, we're first. Or three, we are headed for inevitable disaster. So one, we're rare. Right, so uh, these are the three uh, sub um, thoughts under the uh, category one uh, umbrella, uh, which is that uh, there are no higher uh, civilizations, and that's why we're not uh, seeing any. So possibility one, we're rare. That's to say that the great filter is behind us. Uh, one hope that we have is that the great filter is behind us, but that we've managed to surpass it, which would mean that it is extremely rare for life to make it to uh, our level. Uh, that diagram there shows only two species making it past, and we are one of them. The scenario would explain why there are no type three civilizations, but it would also mean that we could be one of the few exceptions now that we've made it this far. It would mean that we have hope. On the surface, this might sound a bit like people 500 years ago, suggesting that the earth is the center of the universe because it implies that we're special. However, something that scientists call the observation selection effect suggests that anyone who is pondering their own rarity is inherently part of an intelligent life success story. And whether they're actually rare or quite common, the thoughts they ponder, which they draw will be identical. This forces us to admit that being special is at least a possibility. And if we are special, when, when exactly did we become special? That's to say, when did we, uh, which step did we surpass that almost everyone else gets stuck on? Right. So now I'm going a layer deeper. Uh, so got the umbrella category of there are no higher uh, so uh, subcategory that we're rare, and then subcategory that we've got these other possibilities. One possibility. The great filter could be at the very beginning. It might be incredibly unusual for life to begin at all. This is a candidate because it took about a billion years of Earth's existence for life to finally happen. And we've tried extensively to replicate that event in the laboratory, and we've never been able to do it. So they get together uh, like uh, the, the conditions of what they thought the atmosphere and the ocean looked like, you know, billions of years ago and spark with electricity. And we've just never been able to create life artificially from scratch. If this is indeed the great filter, it would mean that not only is there no intelligent life out there, there may be no other life at all. Another possibility, maybe the great filter could be the jump from simple prokaryote life to complex eukaryote cells. After prokaryotes came into being, we're talking about very simple bacteria, they remained that way for almost 2 billion years on Earth before making the evolutionary jump to being complex and having a nucleus. Uh, if this is the great filter, it would mean that the universe is teeming with simple prokaryote life and almost uh, nothing beyond that. So, uh, yeah, for, remember Earth about four and a half billion years old, the first billion years or so, you just like covered in lava and life wasn't going to happen anyway. Then life does happen. And for a couple of billion years, all it was was just simple bacteria floating around the ocean. That was almost half the life of Earth. Um, oh, oh, and um, so. Speaking of these, uh, these uh, complex cells with, with the nucleus, uh, even you to this day, uh, like, uh, we are eukaryotes. Uh, we actually have two different sets of DNA. So one set of DNA says, you know, you have like two eyes and 10 fingers, blah, blah. But there's another, there's a completely separate set of DNA that's just for your mitochondria. And the thought is that 
uh, again, go back a couple billion years ago, um, that maybe they were these two separate uh, simple eukaryote cells that uh, merged together and realized that um, instead of one digesting the other, that they could actually um, coexist symbiotically. And then you know they go on reproducing, and that's why, even to this day, uh, we have two different sets of uh, DNA right, from those two original uh, organisms that merged. There are a number of other possibilities. Some even think that the most recent leak we've made to our current intelligence is a great filter candidate. Well, the leap from semi-intelligent life, think chimps, to intelligent life, humans, uh, might not at first seem like a miraculous step. Stephen Pinker rejects the idea of an inevitable climb upward of evolution, since evolution does not strive for a goal, but just happens. It uses the adaptation most useful for a given ecological niche. The fact that Earth, um, this led to technological intelligence only once so far, they suggest that this outcome of natural selection is rare, and hence by no means a certain development of the evolution uh, of a tree of life. Um, Personally, I don't take a lot of stock in that, that particular idea. There actually were different species of humans even just a few thousand years ago, but um, they all died all except for Homo sapiens. Uh, so it, 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 even chimps can do some crazy stuff too and use basic tools. And there are animals that use tools. So eh, I don't know. It's really fine. Anyway, most leaks do not qualify as great filter candidates. Any possible great filter must be a one in a billion type thing where one or more total freak occurrences need to happen. Just um, to provide a crazy exception. Uh, for that reason, something like the jump from single cell to multi-cell life is, uh, uh, it says is ruled out because it's happened as many as 46 time in isolated incidents on this planet alone. Uh, for the same reason, if we were to find fossilized eukaryote cell on Mars, it would rule out the above simple to complex cell leap uh, as a possible great filter as well as anything before that point on the evolutionary chain. Because if complex life happened on both Earth and Mars, it's almost definitely not a one in a billion freak occurrence. If we are indeed rare, it could be because of a fluky biological event, but it might also be attributed to what's called the rare Earth hypothesis, which suggests that though there may be many Earth-like planets, maybe the particular conditions of Earth, whether it's related to the specifics of our solar system, Maybe the relationship we have with our moon, by the way, our moon is unusually large for a planet of our size and helps uh, maintain the stability of Earth's axis and therefore the climate, maybe something to do with that. Uh, maybe something about our particular weather or ocean conditions, uh, something about the planet itself uh, is exceptionally friendly to life. Maybe something we're overlooking or taking for granted. And as we're like, oh, what, what's all the planets have liquid water, but we don't really just maybe how special or a bit, you know. Uh, possibility two, we're the first. Uh, for group one thinkers, as to say, higher civilizations still don't exist out there. If the great filter is not behind us, one hope that we have uh, is that conditions in the universe are just recently for the first time since the Big Bang about 14 billion years ago, reaching a place that would allow intelligent life to develop. Uh, in that case, we may many other species may be on our way to superintelligence and it simply hasn't happened yet. We may happen to be at the right place at the right time to become the first or one of the first of these superintelligent civilizations. Uh, one example of a phenomenon that could make this realistic is the prevalence of gamma ray bursts, insanely huge explosions that we've observed in distant galaxies. In the same way that it took um, early Earth a few hundred million years before the asteroids and volcanoes died down and life even became possible, it might be that the first chunk of the universe's existence was full of cataclysmic events like gamma ray bursts that would incinerate everything nearby from time to time and prevent any life from developing past a certain stage. Right? Um, it, it, there would be no way to know if a gamma ray burst was headed away because, of course, it would travel at the speed of light. So just say, like, like, happy birthday, you, you just blew off your atmosphere. Uh, now, perhaps we're in the midst of an astrobiological phase transition, and this is the first time that life has had been able to evolve uh, for this long uninterrupted. Possibility three. Uh, well, maybe we're just headed for inevitable disaster. That's to say that the great filter is ahead of us. If we're neither rare nor early, group one thinkers conclude that the great filter must be in our future. It would suggest that life does regularly evolve to where we are, but that something is preventing it from getting much further and reaching high intelligence in almost all cases, in which case we're unlikely to be an exception. 
One possible future great filter is a regularly occurring cataclysmic natural event like the aforementioned gamma ray burst, except that unfortunately they're not done yet, and it's just a matter of time before all life on Earth is suddenly wiped out by one. Another candidate is the possible inevitability that nearly all intelligent civilizations end up destroying themselves once a certain level of technology is reached. So I'm going to add in my own uh, Griffin commentary here. So one uh, common go-to example that you'd be familiar with is something like nuclear annihilation. So if one country needs to use nuclear weapons, you can run a little game theory simulation and say, oh, well, that could very well lead to something called mutually assured destruction. You guys probably learned about that in the history class, um, uh, acronym MAD. Uh, or, or, or it might be something accidental. Uh, I remember reading there was uh, this fluke laboratory experiment where there was some genetically modified, I want to say it was like bacteria that they left overnight and came back the next day. It was, oh, it just like killed everything in the surrounding environment. And, oh boy, if that got out into the environment, that would just wipe out everything. Or, uh, it, you know, could, or, you know, what, what if, um, in a recent example with uh, COVID, you know, there's speculation that, you know, it was possibly, um, uh, like modified in the laboratory, it, it, whether that's the case or not, you know, that's definitely a hypothetical on the table to happen just in general. Uh, so, you know, what's to say we don't like, oops, we just made two grades and it's contagious all over the place, right? So, um, yeah. uh, or um, uh, a fun one is, uh, you guys ever heard of something called gray goo? Gray goo? Right. Tell you guys about this one. So, uh, uh, technology gets more and more advanced. One of the uh, technologies you guys have probably seen in your lifetime is application of uh, nanotechnology, so like nanobots. And so what's some crazy things we could do with like tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic uh, robots? Okay. One thing, I mean, if they're, if they're that small, one thing they could do is actually supplement your immune system really well. So if you've got these tiny nanobots uh, floating around in your bloodstream, they could uh, keep you healthy, you know, uh, keep your body clean. If there's any cancer, just immediately clear that out. You could never get sick again. Okay? So that sounds really good. Okay, uh, okay so how do you uh, manufacture or replicate these things? Well, you could have maybe some machine that does that, but um, it might be more efficient to steal a page out of the book of nature and have them self-replicate. Okay, so program self-replication. But then you, you could say, okay, well, I could see how that uh, programming could go wrong. Uh, so what if there's like some oops runaway effect where um, there's some glitch in the programming and they just start consuming all organic material and just replicating themselves? Well, the effect would be that they would just go around consuming the entire world, kind of like a cancer, and uh, you'd have the world just covered in these tiny nanobots and nothing else organic. Uh, it's called gray goo. Yeah, we'll be on that planet. Uh, so this is why, so back to the essay here, I'll just give you guys some examples of um, what he's talking about. This is why Oxford University philosopher Nick Bostrom says that, quote, no news is good news. The discovery of even simple life on Mars would be devastating because it would cut out a number of potential great filters uh, behind us. And if we were to find fossilized complex life on Mars, Bostrom says it would be by far the worst news ever printed on a newspaper cover because it would mean that the great filter is almost definitely ahead of us, ultimately dooming our species. Bostrom believes that when it comes to the Fermi paradox, the silence of the night sky is golden. Explanation group two. And so the, um, all those were group one thoughts that okay, well, there, there's probably not other higher civilizations out there at all. But now we're going to another camp of thought, which says that uh, higher civilizations are out there, but there might be logical reasons maybe we haven't heard from them. Group two explanations get rid of any notion that we're rare or special or the first said anything. On the contrary, they believe in the mediocrity principle, whose starting point is that there is nothing unusual or rare about our galaxy, our solar system, our planet, our level of intelligence, until evidence proves otherwise. They're also much less quick to assume that the lack of evidence of higher intelligence uh, beings is evidence of their non-existence, emphasizing the fact that our search for our signals stretches only about 100 light years away from us. Um, so less than 1% across the galaxy. So we're back to that graphic right there. And suggesting a number of possible explanations. Here are 10. So 10 possible explanations under this group two camp of thoughts that there are higher intelligent civilizations out in the galaxy, but why have we not heard them uh, from them? Possibility one, super intelligent life could very well have already visited Earth, but uh, maybe long before we were here. In the scheme of things, sentient humans have only been around for 
uh, according to this essay, about 50,000 years, a little blip of time. If contact had happened before then, it might have made some ducks flip out and run into the water, and that's about it. Further, recorded history only goes about back about 5,500 years. So that's about how long writing has been around for, about 5,500 years. It was a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of time in the big scheme of things. So maybe there were some group of ancient hunter-gatherer tribes that uh, had some kind of alien contact, but just had no way to write it down, tell anyone about it. So maybe the aliens showed up and said hi, like, you know, 40,000 years ago. Yeah. Possibility two. The galaxy has been colonized, but we just live in some desolate rural area of the galaxy. Uh, for example, the Americas may have been colonized by Europeans long before anyone in some small Inuit tribe in far northern Canada realized that, that this had happened. There could be an urbanization component to the interstellar dwellings of higher species in which all the neighboring solar systems in a certain area are colonized and in communication. And it might just be impractical and purposeless for anyone to deal with coming all the way out to some random part of the spiral where we happen to live. Possibility three, maybe the entire concept of physical colonization is a hilariously backward concept to a more advanced species. Uh, remember the picture of the type two civilization and their Dyson sphere? Where's the Dyson? Ah, there's the Dyson sphere. Uh, with all that energy, they might have created a perfect environment that satisfies their every need. They might have crazy advanced ways of reducing their need for resources and zero interest in leaving their happy utopia to explore a cold, empty, undeveloped uh, universe. Uh, if you guys have taken economics, one of the founding uh, principles that probably in like chapter one of an economics textbook uh, is what, 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 is, what does economics uh, like seek to solve? And it's, it's the problem of scarcity. So uh, this idea that you might always want more and more and more of something, but you only have scarce resources. It might be like physical goods, it might be like time could be a resource. And then, so how do you allocate you know, your time, money, resources? Um, okay. uh, but if you had something like this, could it be possible that maybe that solves the economic problem? And could you ever reach, reach some level of abundance where you're like, you know what, I'm good and we're all good and we don't really need to go around, you know, like get more stuff. Um, and even, so to continue with this, an even more advanced civilization might view the entire physical world as a horribly primitive place, having long ago conquered their own biology and uploaded their brains into a virtual reality eternal life paradise. Uh, living in a physical world of biology, mortality, wants and needs might seem to them the way that we view uh, primitive ocean species living in a dark, frigid sea. Ooh. Possibility four. Uh, there are scary predator civilizations out there, and most intelligent life knows better that, than to broadcast any outgoing signals and advertise their location. This is an unpleasant concept because it would help explain the lack of any signals being received by SETI satellites. It also means that we might be the super uh, naive newbies who are being unbelievably stupid and risky by ever broadcasting outward signals. There is a debate going on about whether we should engage in METI, which is an acronym that stands for messaging to extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, the reverse of SETI, which is search for. So search for and messaging too. Uh, most people say that we should not engage in METI. Stephen Hawking warns, if aliens visit us, the outcome would be much as when Columbus landed in America, which did not turn out well for the Native Americans. Even Carl Sagan, general believer that any civilization advanced enough for the interstellar travel would be altruistic and not hostile, uh, called the pr practice of METI deeply unwise and immature, and recommended that the newest children in a strange and uncertain cosmos should listen quietly for a long time, patiently learning about the universe and comparing notes before shouting into an unknown jungle that we do not understand. Possibility five. Maybe there's only one instance of a higher intelligent life, a super predator civilization who is far more advanced than everyone else and actively keeps it that way by exterminating any intelligence once they get past a certain level. Uh, so this is maybe, maybe a continuation of the previous one. But this would uh, the way it might work is that it would be an inefficient use of resources to exterminate all emerging intelligences, maybe because most just die out on their own. Like, okay, well, they're gonna nuke each other anyway. But past a certain point, the super beings make their move because to them, an emerging intelligence uh, species becomes like a virus as it starts to grow and spread. 
Uh, this theory suggests that whoever was first in the galaxy to reach intelligence won, and no one else now has a chance. This would uh, explain the lack of activity out there because it would keep the number of super intelligent civilizations to just one. And if they're like, you know, on the other side of the galaxy, then they're not really getting uh, good access to their signals. Possibility six. Maybe there's plenty of activity and noise out there, but our technology is too primitive and we're listening for the wrong things. Like, for example, walking into a modern day office building, turning on a walkie talkie. And when you hear no activity, which of course you wouldn't because everyone's texting and not using walkie talkies, determining that uh, the building well, must be empty, uh, just using the wrong equipment. Or maybe as Carl Sagan pointed out, it could be that our minds work exponentially faster or slower than some other form of intelligence. So for example, if it takes them 12 years to say, hello, then when we get that signal to us, it would just sound like white noise and that's all we would perceive it to be. Possibility seven, we are receiving contact from other intelligent life, but the government is hiding it. Uh, and his take on this is that uh, he doesn't subscribe to this uh, idea himself, but he has to at least mention it once because it's a pretty popular idea. And that's what I always says about that. Uh, possibility eight, higher civilizations are aware of us and are observing us, uh, also known as the zoo hypothesis. As far as we know, super intelligent civilizations exist in a tightly regulated galaxy, and maybe Earth is treated like part of a vast and protected national park with the strict look but don't touch rule for planets uh, like ours. We wouldn't notice them because if a far smarter species wanted to observe us, they would know how to do so without us realizing it. Maybe there's a rule similar to Star Trek's prime directive, which prohibits super intelligence, uh, super intelligent beings from making any open contact with a, a species like ours or revealing themselves in any way uh, until maybe we've reached uh, some uh, level uh, ourselves. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's, there's a subcategory of the zoo hypothesis of uh, Oh, um, it's, like, it's like lab hypothesis or, or something like this. Uh, this this idea that they might be watching, you know, wh whether they're um, interfering or not, uh, they're looking at us kind of like an, an experiment. Like maybe we're some uh, rare case. Like, oh, hey, look, it looks like a technology is developing, and we've got the story, and we can watch it in real time. And uh, yeah. uh, possibility uh, nine: higher civilizations are here all around us, but we're too primitive to perceive them. Uh, Dr. Michi Okaku sums it up like this. Let's say we have an anthill in the middle of a forest. All right next to the anthill, they're building a 10-lane superhighway. And the question is, would the ants even be able to understand what a 10-lane superhighway is? Would the ants be able to understand the technology and the intentions of the beings building the highway right next to them? So it's not that we can't pick up the signals from Planet X using our technology. It's that we can't even comprehend what the beings from Planet X are or what they're trying to do. It's so beyond us that if they really wanted to enlighten us, it would be like trying to teach ants about the internet. Uh, another paragraph there, but it was right, possibility 10. Uh, maybe we're just wrong about our entire reality altogether. There are a lot of ways that we might just be totally off about everything about the way we think. Our universe might appear one way and be something else entirely like a hologram, or maybe we're the aliens we were planted here as an experiment or some sort of form of fertilizer. There's even a chance that we're all part of a computer simulation by some researcher from another world and that other forms of life simply weren't programmed into the simulation. Uh, or it might be that uh, something, you know, if we go sort of connect to that walkie talkie example I'm saying, uh, you know, maybe all our instruments, you know, including our own eyes and ears and senses, uh, just aren't able to perceive other dimensions that maybe other beings are like, oh yeah, there's totally like, you know, five, six, and seven dimensions, and, you know, you humans can only perceive, like, three spatial in one time, so, ah, uh, we, you know, we can see you, and you can't see us, sort of thing. Uh, so, concluding paragraphs. Uh, as we continue along with our possibly futile search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I'm not really sure what I'm rooting for. Frankly, learning either that we are officially alone in the universe or that we are officially joined by others would be creepy, which is the theme uh, with all of surreal storylines listed above. Whatever the truth actually is, it's mind-blowing. We don't even know, but it's, it's something mind-blowing one way or the other. Beyond its shocking science fiction component, the Fermi paradox uh, also leaves me with a deep humbling, not just the normal, oh yeah, I'm microscopic and my life lasts for three seconds humbling that the universe always triggers, 
The Fermi paradox brings out a sharper, more personal humbling, uh, one that can only happen after spending hours of research hearing your species' most renowned scientists present insane theories, change their minds again and again, wildly contradict each other, reminding us that future generations will look at us the same way we looked at ancient people who were sure that the stars were on the underside of a dome in heaven and think, wow, they really had no idea what was going on. Uh, compounding all of this uh, is the blow to our species self-esteem that comes with this talk of type two, type three civilizations. Here on earth, we're the king of our little castle, proud ruler of a group of people that share the planet with us. And in this bubble with no competition and no one to judge us, uh, it's rare that we're ever confronted with the idea of being dramatically inferior to anyone else. But after spending a lot of time with type two and three civilizations, uh, our power and pride uh, seem a bit David Brent-esque. Uh, I looked up, David Brent was, um, I think, a character of the original Office, like back in the UK, like, you know, the show The Office. There's, there's an original British one, so I think sort, sort of like a Michael Scott character, I think. Uh, that said, uh, given the normal outlook is that humanity is a lonely orphan on a tiny rock in the middle of a desolate universe, the humbling fact that we are probably not as smart as we think we are and the possibility that uh, a lot of what we're sure of might be wrong sounds wonderful. It opens the door just a crack to uh, that maybe, just maybe, there might be more to the story than we realize. Do, do, do. Right, so thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed Fermi Paradox. Oh, yep, got 20 seconds to the bell. So wrap it up right there.